Hi, my name is Jason Harris, and this is Uncommon. Uncommon is a production by Neural, an agency that helps both brands and talent tell their story. To learn more, just visit neural.com. That's N E U R A L L E.com. My guest this week, Jason Harris, co founder and CEO of Mechanism and author of The Soulful Art of Persuasion. I was leaning on Brendan for, for some inside jokes. Um, and I hear you've got this shoe addiction. I do, yeah. <laughs> What's, what, tell us about that. I, uh, I can't stop buying sneakers. Okay. And I have a whole closet in my apartment that's just sneakers, most of which I've never worn. Okay. I, I like, I'm always scouring StockX for different kinds of shoes. Oh, uh, yeah. And if I see one, that, that to me, they're, they're like artwork and I just want to have it even if I, it's not very functional or I don't need it the pair and so i almost keep them in a closet and look at how pretty they are it's it's not great how how many pairs would you have today uh i recently did a purge but i probably have like 115 something like that do you mainly flip them on things like StockX and other platforms i don't even i don't even make money off them really i'll give them i'll give them to people in my office if if i'm kind of done with them Okay, so yeah, it, you remind me then of uh, a founder here locally, a big independent agency like Mechanism. Um, the headcount's probably a little bit smaller, but he's got this obsession with sneakers as well. I don't know how big his collection is. I feel like he's got two hundred pairs. Um, yeah, that's probably right, but it's significant. But I have a New York apartment, so I have to like keep <laughs> pur- purging them because there's only so much room. <laughs> but uh, to me, that just I don't know. They they make me happy. But I'm just glad I don't have like a, a car addiction or a, a, you know, a furniture addiction. You know, at least shoes are not crazy expensive. Well, why shoes? Why do you think that is? Is that something that you grew up with? You know, it probably has to do with like design and marketing. And, you know, I'm pretty much only by Nikes. Okay. But uh, I just, I love the brand and what it represents. And they're always coming out with new styles. Mm. And, uh, I think it's partly brand love and partly I like mixing up shoes and, you know, where I pretty much wear black, like a lot of New Yorkers. And so the only, the only pop of color comes on my feet. So I'm always, you know, wearing pink shoes, red shoes, you name it, whatever, whatever to give it a little pop, a little edge. Let's jump a little bit South to Virginia. So you were born uh, I, I remember in, I think it was Fairfax, Virginia. Did you spend much of your, what's sort of your earliest inception memory of your childhood? That's a good question. Um, it's sort of a blur. Like I don't have like that one thing that pops out, but I played, uh, I always played soccer growing up. Okay. And so I have, and I coach my kids' soccer teams. Uh, that's sort of the memory I, I always remember back from Virginia just every weekend playing soccer okay since i was like a little kid that was uh was the team it was like the local team a big thing uh kind of virginia is it was more like texas it's like football kind of was the sport yeah so it was sort of it was unusual so to speak to be playing soccer there not unusual but it wasn't it wasn't drawing massive crowds i'll put it that way (laughs) yeah what, what, what did you think you were going to be when you were a kid? I always thought, you know, when I was younger, I always loved um, the way, you know, different, we, because Fairfax, Virginia is near D.C., and I'd, I'd go to the city a lot, and I always loved going to museums and looking at the different monuments and how they were built. Mm. And I thought I'd be like an architect or an engineer. I always loved studying and looking at buildings. Interesting. But then, but then pretty early on, I pivoted, you know, way, way before high school, like maybe entering high school. And um, I was a TV addict, so I love watching TV. And, and I'd always study those interstitials, those commercials in between the shows. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, somebody's selling these brands and these companies and 
that seems cool. Like, it seems like kind of fun. So <laughs> I kind of pivoted. And, and then really through high school and then college, I just knew that's what the field I was going to go into, which is unusual. Um, but I, yeah. I kind of, I kind of knew it early on. Yeah. I think at that age, it is unusual to think about advertising unless you have family in that area. Like I know I was reading that you had that interest in watching ads. Um, yeah. and uh, specifically, I think it was Lego, my ego and the Kool-Aid. Ad. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Do you know those ads? Yeah, yeah. The Kool-Aid ad is pretty well. It's like a universal thing, right? It is? Okay, yeah. He would yeah. just like smash through like a high school dance. And, oh, and yeah. Like his, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the sugar water would be spilling out of his head. And <laughs> all the kids would be psyched and all the parents would be grumpy. They'd yeah. be pissed. You know, this guy just destroyed my wall. Well, it's so universal that like fa- the family guy bit. Have you seen the Family Guy bit where Kool Aid Man just runs through like a courtroom? He's like, "Oh yeah, no way, that's amazing." I have not <laughs> seen that. I'm gonna look that up. Yeah, just I love that. Kool Aid Family Guy. It's uh, it's fucking hilarious. Um, Did you grow up in Melbourne? Yeah, I grew up in Melbourne. Yeah, but um, my family, uh, they weren't in advertising, but they were always in. Um, like my dad's a fourth generation printer, so oh, wow. we were always like obsessed with media so to speak but my favorite thing as a kid having gotten into this space now in hindsight it sort of seemed quite obvious but my favorite thing was my grandfather greek immigrant never paid for any movie just recorded it on tv so we he had like a wall of movies so like and there was a heavy british influence so we'd watch things like faulty towers and then he'd record all the disney films and all these different shows but my favorite bit was the ads in between. That's awesome. That's what that's, that's there with me. Yeah. So I still kept a lot of those videos just for the old ads. Like, uh, what's one of my favorite ones? Like the, uh, the snappy Tom ad. Uh, I don't know if snappy Tom was like a real food. Here's like the cats of Australia made their choice. And then it's like this whole, they made this whole <laughs> ecosystem out of this song. Um, uh, and then there was, uh, I think it was Alka Seltzer. Like the guy who's got like heartburn, he's like, that's a spicy meatball. Yeah, that we had that one. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a spicy meatball. Yeah. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. Yeah. Um, there was the John West ads. They were big here. Um, I don't know if you, if John West was a thing in, it was big in Canada and Australia, but um, it's like a tuna brand. And the guy would go fight bears um, for like salmon and tuna and stuff like that, like in the river. It's fucking no hilarious. Way. Yeah, it's a, start. it's a very good ad. Anyway, what, what did you th- what did your parents like do when you were growing up? They were both uh, in academia, so they were teachers. Okay, and they they were always reading. You know, my house was like full of readers. Me, not so much. You know, I, obviously, I I wrote a book, so I'm into reading now. <laughs> <laughs> I got into reading. You know, when I was an adult, but as a kid, I just wanted to like go explore and have experiences. And my parents were more, much more homebodies and and intellectuals, and we're like polar opposites in that in that way. But they, uh, you know, they were not watching TV or checking out the commercials no, at all. I was down reading. in the basement doing that. Yeah, they were reading. <laughs> Did, when you look at your, because we all have this, right, where we see things in our parents that we, we sort of shudder at, like, you know, we've got that certain tick or that certain saying or um, this way of doing things. For me, it was always, um, you know, I picked it up from my dad, this this principle of hard work just indirectly through watching him. It's almost like an addictive thing. Um, yeah. Which it, it, the double-edged sword is that you can't relax, so while it's a good trait to have, it's also a negative trait and you see that in your dad. So was there things that you had growing up that now you realize you have that you've picked up from your parents? I sort of went the other way where <laughs> I was like, the, I'm going to do the opposite of what they do. Yeah. Like instead of marrying my parents, I really like pushed against my parents. So they weren't great with money, right? Okay. So finances were were sometimes an issue. And so I just remember being like that. I'm going to make sure that's never an issue for me. Like, 
Okay. I'm not, I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to, I'm going to invest when I'm young, you know, try to try to make sure I'm stable and not have the worries that, that they had. So I sort of pushed against some of the things that, that stood out for me. Um, I always want, I'm like, I'm going to travel. They don't want to, they don't, they don't love traveling. I'm always going to travel. And so I sort of like you maybe got, you got some traits from your parents. I sort of went the other way and pushed against some of the things that, that I saw around me. Yeah. That said, they had, um, really great moral compass. They would always do the right thing. You know, they're like the kind of people that, after a movie, they if there was trash in their row, they'd pick it up. Like if other people left trash, mm. you know, everyone just in America, you go to a movie, you leave all your stuff. Yeah, people you know, like someone's it. gonna someone's gonna clean it up. Yeah, you know they they were they would always do that. They would they would always tell the truth. They don't drink. They don't smoke. They don't you know they're they're like their moral compass for doing the right thing is super strong. And so that's one trade I I try as much as I can to. Well, not that I don't drink. Of course I drink. But, uh, <laughs> that I try to emulate is they, they were always grounded in make the right choice. And that's something that definitely stood with me. Yeah. So they're quite civic. That makes Very. sense. That, that explains why you, you've gotten involved in sort of the, the political sphere is that civic mindedness. Yeah, definitely. And that and growing up in D.C. area, you know, outside of D.C. and Virginia. Yeah. It's it's like it's it's sort of like. Um, if you live in LA, the dominating industry is like entertainment. Mm. So everyone's talking about entertainment and outside of DC and like the Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, DC area. Yeah. Politics is like the driving theme. Well, how far is, I was just thinking, how far is Fairfax from um, the district? I think it's like maybe like 18 miles, 15 miles. Wow. Yeah. It's not far at all. No, it's not that far. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean that makes a lot of sense. A lot of yeah. sense. But but the other thing I did one one last thing because <laughs> I love this conversation about how, do we emulate or go against our parents? My parents were not um, into into sports at all, right? Okay. And so when I had kids, like my entire weekend is dominated by shepherding my kids back and forth to sports. And or if they're in like a rec league, something that I could coach because it's not, it's not like a, um, a select league or a travel league. They have far better coaches that do that for them. Right. But if there's anything I can coach, I'm always going to coach and I'm always going to, it's like a priority on my weekends is, Sport. is sports where they, they had no interest. Like they, a lot of times they wouldn't go to my events. They, they do something else. Really? So it sounds well, like I have terrible parents, but they're yeah, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it just, I just remember thinking like, well, my kids are going to be, I'm yeah. going to every game. They're going to play sports all weekend. <laughs> you know, they're going to play more than one sport. And I'm like all in on it. Do you know what's funny about that is your kids will probably grow up and be like, like I don't want to ever have anything to do with sports. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, I'm totally burnt out on sports. Like, yeah. My kids don't have to play sports. Yeah. So w- what do they like? Your kids obviously play soccer, you mentioned. What else do they play? Baseball. Okay. Baseball yeah. is big in New York. And then, and then uh, they run track. Okay. In any particular... Is baseball, is baseball big there? I know it's obviously like Australian rules and then there's cricket and I know they're in, in rugby, mm. but is, is there also... Does baseball have any popularity there? It's... De- I mean... <sighs> U.S. sports, uh, like we're our religion here in Australia is sport. So, if you can't consume AFL, um, if you can't consume cricket or soccer or rugby, you're watching some other sort of sport. And because everyone's got, you know, cable here essentially, and our system is Foxtel, which is, you know, former Fox system. Okay. You basically watch everything. So you've got ESPN, you've got everything. So everyone watches. If I would to rank it, I would say it's basketball, probably your your football. What is it, NFL? Yep. Then it's a hard split one between baseball and hockey. Like hockey is one of those creeper 
sports. Yeah. Uh, I remember right. a, there was a hockey rink around the corner from me growing up um, that was quite big, but, you know, I, I definitely think basketball is the number one sport here by far. They're trying wow. to rep- so, so do people watch the NBA finals? Oh, that are on right yeah. Now? They're, they're obsessed with it. I mean, oh, we, wow. we knew that COVID was real because the NBA was basically canceled because of COVID. And we had not kicked off our major seasons for AFL or rugby as yet. And so over here, they, our main system, which is the AFL, they were like, shit, this is like really serious. How are we going to do this? Yeah. <laughs> How are we going to do it's this? So, and yeah. It's so, it's so interesting because like the, you guys basically wake up and watch, watch basketball, right? Because it's on like yeah. our evening. So yeah. it's like a morning thing, which is crazy to think about. Yeah, I, I have mates that I used to work with that, um, you know, I, I don't have this pleasure of doing it, that, you know, they're working for someone, they're working from home, they're sitting there typing on the keyboard and just on the TV working from home, they've got the MBA on. That's awesome. That's yeah. crazy to know. I went yeah. to, uh, anyways, I went to um, Melbourne. I loved, I had, I had the absolute best time there. Um, what year? I think it was, must have been last year. Must have been pre, pre like maybe right, kind of like right before. before. What, yeah. In 2020? I think so. It was either that or the end of 2019. And what were you, but, what were you here for? Uh, there's an event called Advertising Week. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's, um, it's where that old, it's like where that amusement park is. In which city? It's in uh, Sydney. Uh, at Luna Park? Luna Park, yeah, that's yeah. what it was, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. so there's a Luna Park in Sydney and Melbourne. Okay, so you went to both Sydney and Melbourne. I went to the, oh, and then I, yes, and then like maybe eight years earlier, I went to the Melbourne Comedy Festival. Ah, uh, yeah, the MIF, yeah. The, it was unbelievable, but we went there because we were working this was kind of, this is pretty early on when we started the agency. We were working on a project with a comedian, Dimitri Martin. Oh yeah. Yeah. And we were trying, we were trying to convince him to work with us on a project for Microsoft. Okay. And he had, it was called clarification, the project we ended up doing, but he had our project with Microsoft. And then he also had on the table being the, remember the Apple PC commercials? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm an Apple, I'm a PC. Yeah, he was going to be that Apple guy for those commercials. No, so shit. he was trying to decide. Yeah, he was trying to decide between <laughs> doing Apple or doing Microsoft, and so we needed this project. We were like, kind of running on fumes because we were pr- fairly new, and we had this massive project like on the hook. But we needed Dimitri Martin because that's the guy that we pushed. Okay, um, you know that's how we pitched it, <laughs> and we flew from i was in san francisco at the time we flew from san francisco to melbourne my partner and i and hung out with dimitri martin in between he was doing comedy festival the comedy festival circuit and befriended him and convinced him to go with our project instead of becoming the apple guy so i have this note here for brendan um to ask about a really early pivotal campaign like clarification yeah that was it that's so funny and so, yeah. And so in, Mel- in Melbourne, we, uh, we just basically like hunted down Dimitri Martin until he, but in between we went to other comedy shows all over Melbourne and it was, right. that festival is so unique. Yeah. That festival is wild, man. That's, we're so lucky to have that here. It's um, like nothing else. There's nothing else like that in the world really. So it's big in the Commonwealth countries to have those those big, big comedy festivals, whereas in the US, like if you're a comedian, you go and do a special, right? Or you do a tour and people yeah. see you. Um, and I was I've lucky enough, I went to the Edinburgh Fringe is probably the next biggest one in comparison to Melbourne or the MIF. And yeah. yeah, Melbourne is still bigger and better, I would say, just in terms of the amount of people that are there. There's a lot of yeah, US that's, comedians that's to make as well. There might be other festivals. But every show is packed. You yeah, know, it's, packed. it's like it's like a rock concert. Like mm. the the embra- like how, yeah, embracing <laughs> comedy like that. I don't know if it's because people are starved for it there, 
or if they, that's just like a way of life is, you know, com- NBA comedy, <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know if that's how it goes. Yeah, that's that. Look, there's a, th- there's a cultural thing about Australia. I don't know if you picked it up, but we're very egalitarian and, um, against hierarchy. And yeah. so, um, comedy is just intertwined in everyday life. Um, it's like a challenging aspect, like, no one trusts authority here. And so comedy is so good for that. It's so cathartic because people just go in and just rag on politicians or leaders or whatever it may be. And it's just all about the common man, so to speak. But that typifies Australia. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. That's great. So what was your, I'm always interested because one of my favorite things to do is see what Americans think about Australia. What was your impression when you came here? Um, a lot of very attractive people. Okay. I'd say for the most part, like super warm. Yep. Uh, I don't know if that jives with what you think. <laughs> and then super heavy drinkers. Yeah. Big drinkers. It's definitely warmer like, than the U S like just, yeah, I felt like you could, you know, talk, just talk to someone at a bar Yeah. and they talk, they talk back to you and, uh, you know, you, <laughs> you'd, you'd have a conversation. Uh, and then, you know, S- Sydney is super healthy. Yeah, very healthy. You know, it's different, but it's like everyone's, you know, eating bowls of vegetables and running on the beach. And <laughs> like LA. <laughs> you know, do, you think, do you think it's like LA it, a bit? It is a lot like LA, yeah. Yeah, it's very pretentious, like in comparison it's, to Melbourne. Yeah, it's Melbourne is more, it's more laid back. Yeah. It has a little bit of a more of a New York vibe. Yeah. I'd say. I think and the best, yeah. the best like analogy is like, it's sort of like San Fran. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say it's like San Francisco. Definitely. Yeah, Cause you got the cold. It gets fucking cold here. Um, you, so you would have been here in April. What a time to be in Australia. It's sort of one of the best times I reckon autumn. You're like, what's the, so it's winter now. What's the weather like? I mean, it's cold for us. It was, um, about two degrees overnight, but for you guys, that's probably like a warm winter's night, right? So yeah. two degree, oh, two degrees uh, Celsius. So what's that? Two degree, I'm terrible at this Fahrenheit thing, Celsius to Fahrenheit. So it was 35 degrees. 35 overnight. degrees, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to say. The only <laughs> time I, I ran into any trouble in Australia was in Sydney. You know, uh, we went, went to Bondi. Oh, yeah. And and swam in that the iceberg. No, no, right. And then have you ever been there and done yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course you have. And then there's a sauna that you get warmed up in afterwards. Yeah. And I was holding the door open uh, for my for my partner, and they, I got screamed at by like ten Australians that were in the sauna. <laughs> and that, that's the only time I was like, oh, wow, they could, they could kind of get ornery. Yeah, yeah. They were saying like, what the fuck? You know, they're like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, like, <laughs> they're probably like, shut the fucking door, mate. <laughs> yeah, shut the fucking door. What are you doing? Yeah. And he started screaming at me. I was like, oh, man, I thought I was like popular here. I thought people liked me, but. <laughs> yeah. No, we, you know, you we love it. it. Yeah. We, we love Americans, but it's I, I think like it's a bit of a – um it's a bit harsh sometimes when like you would see that scenario as like a really like ramped up scenario in the States, but here like that's just normal. Like the next moment you could be having a beer with those people and it's all fine. Oh yeah. No, we're way more passive aggressive. <laughs> it's like we're, we have like undertones. We'll say things that sound, you're like, how do I interpret that? Like, yeah. You know, was he being a dick or was he like, you know? <laughs> so like well, I've had friends who work in the U S and culturally it's just the match is not there. Like as in, um, I have this one friend, uh, Ben, he was working in New York and he was in this office and cause we're all just shit stirrers. Right. And so it's this guy that he got given this nickname <laughs> because he had like these shoes or something like that. And I, I don't know, let's say his nickname was Smokey. And he okay. just kept calling him. He'd be like, Smokes, hey, Smokey, can I grab that pen? And he just like do it on purpose, like all day oh my long. God, so funny. And so like the like in Australia, that's standard. Like it's just funny. Um, and groups of men are notorious for doing that. But this guy, 
who got this nickname Smokey just flipped. He turned around and he's like, excuse me, can you stop calling me Smokey? And like, he oh just went off and the whole office was dead quiet. Like we're talking about 50, 60 people. And oh my God. He's a real like straight shooter American type. He's got like the, the buzz cut sort of army haircut. Um, yeah, he and did it did not, not. It did not. He, did, he did he's not supposed fly. to go along with it and then give <laughs> yeah. it back, right? Yeah, you meant to give it back. You're like, yeah, shut yeah. up. Anyway, yeah. Well, I, all the other thing about Australians because I hired an Australian woman who helps manage our New York office, and she she's awesome. They will just keep hiring more Australians. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's almost like they get in and they're like, oh, and it's pretty good. It's pretty good here. Yeah. I'm going to make sure I hire as many fucking Australians as I can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gordon, they look Gordon, out, they look out for each other. Gordon Ramsay's got a whole bit about that. Like, um, about ragging on Australians who just come in to like his restaurant. And then all of a sudden one of the sous chefs he hires is Australian. And then all of a sudden there's five or six of them. And he's like, yeah, it's un- it's unreal. Um, that's so funny. Yeah. Cause we, we all travel and, uh, when we find something good in a certain place, we all just gravitate towards it. And I kind of love that though. It's like yeah. a real, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get your back mentality. Yeah. I'm going to start calling her Smokey too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> just what, to see. What's it? Uh, you probably don't want to disclose her name. You can email me afterwards. I'll give you a real shit stirring name to give her. Okay, good. And then she'll, she'll be like, oh yeah. yeah. That sounds good. So was that campaign for mechanism or was that back in the day when you were like a TBWA or, um, no, no, that was a mechanism campaign. Okay. Or early, early days, you know, now we're, we got four offices with 200 people. We got 25 clients. Like we're established. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> but early, earlier days, uh, there was like two or three times when like we almost completely went out of business and we yeah. needed that one thing, that one job to like pull through last minute <laughs> for us to to keep going. And somehow it, it worked out. So we got we got lucky. I'm sort of uh, for my agency. We specialize in social and influence, and particularly like a sub specialization in TikTok. I reckon we've just gotten past that phase as an agency, where you just you're going from one meal to another if that makes sense oh definitely yeah that makes sense it, I, it was interesting looking at your background i mean you obviously studied economics and then you you'd sort of your story gives me a bit of hope because you you're oh, the good. client <laughs> you're, you're the client management new business guy which is what i am but yeah. you become an early stage founder you yeah. know you're obviously a natural born salesman and so i look back at that and i go oh shit okay you can do that. You don't have to be some wild creative uh, to, to well, be you successful. Need, you in this need business. both, you know, and it, yeah. it's still whatever business you're running, you got to have business minded people to run it. Yeah. You know, you need that partnership. So, you know, quick background. I, I knew I wanted to go into advertising. I did study economics, but that was really to make my parents happy. <laughs> yeah. um, and then as soon as I got out of school, I, I started working at, at agencies, I you know in LA and eventually San Francisco, where we founded the the agency. But I would always look at these different agencies, and I knew I want was entrepreneurial. I wanted to start something eventually. But I would take what I saw from the leaders as good and bad, and sort of keep track and you know take take notes and what I would bring to a company that, that I had eventually. And so it was really a great training ground. But before I, before mechanism, I started a company by myself and uh, it was a, it was a production company. We were doing like branded content. We were doing like TV, which is kind of interesting. My background. Cause I like, I like the ads in between the shows. Mm. This was pitching brands to do TV shows where the, right. where the media company, the media platform would then sell ads against the TV shows, but the brand would pay to make the TV shows. So we did one with Adidas and Xbox. And, um, but I started that company first and it was just me. Right. So that was plan and, C. Yeah, that was plan C. And it was just me doing the, you know, hiring the, the producers and directors and doing the invoicing and the pitching. Like mm. it was really, 
just me. I had a, a little bit of help with a, a friend of mine in, in Atlanta, but I burned out on that gig pretty quickly, like a year and a half. I don't know if you ever did anything on your own, but it's hard. It's really, it's really challenging, but you, you kind of want to, cause you have that hard work gene. You're like, no, I can do it. Like I'm going to yeah, do it my way. Out. I'm going to start it my own. And then, uh, with mechanism having, you know, other, other partners, it's just so much more rewarding to, to do it with other people. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you know, go together. I think that statement's so true. Yeah. Cause you just can't sustain it when you do things. I mean, maybe some, some people can, but I was, I wasn't wired that way. Yeah. You end up blowing a gasket pretty much. You really do. Yeah. you just because, like, like I said, that hard working ethos that you have, it also means that you can't recognize when you're about to blow a gasket. So it's only when you finally blow the gasket that you realize that it was too far. The gasket has been blown. The gasket has been blown. It's interesting. You mentioned about the economics thing and like my dad, um, Greek families, like you've got to do a profession. So I did accounting, accounting and finance at uni. And like, I think I lasted a couple of years until I sort of got back into the sort of the media space. Did you work in that field after? Yeah. So I, I was like, um, I studied bank and finance, did an accounting internship, fucking hated it. Went into sort of the <laughs> trading desk space. Loved that. Like loved the environment, the sales environment, but it was so intense. It never, ever stopped because markets never stop. Like I'd be, I could be up at 6 a.m. and up until 1 a.m. because the US Open was happening. So oh it was God, just, it was not, there. yeah, it was not tenable. And then, then I got into sort of sales, selling services to those people. And then I realized, because my, my now wife and co-founder of the business was working at PwC and a few independents like Taboo Group. She was a creative director. And um, we started this podcast and we were just like, maybe we should start selling these services to people. And it sort of just spun out from that. Um, and that's how it started? That's how it started, yeah. So, you know, like what you were saying before about having someone to work with, I could not do what I do without her and vice versa. That's amazing. It's just not possible. It's amazing that you guys can work together. I know. That's a lot of people say that. And you guys specialize, you do a lot with TikTok, right? Yeah, a lot of TikTok. I mean, that's how I found Brendan. Brendan and I were chatting over TikTok. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, like TikTok here is fairly nascent like it is in the US, but it's... um. Yeah, social and influence, but TikTok is. De- I I just want to be known as the TikTok guy over the next. Couple well, that's going to serve you well. Yeah, because so, it's definitely it's gaining ground on everything. Oh yeah, it's it's quite nuts to see like campaign returns, and so that's like you know you were saying before about just having that thing, like that Dimitri Martin campaign is like you just needed it to keep things going. I feel yeah. like we've just gotten through that stage over the last couple of months with. And it, that thing has been TikTok. Because without that, I don't know what, you know, there's so many areas that you can specialize in. I don't know what would have made us different otherwise. It's, it's a hard field to define yourself. You know what I mean? I, totally. But having that expertise, everyone needs it. You. Yes, you. Are you intrigued by this episode? If so... Go to our footer on the website, N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E.com, neural.com. We're going to give you an insight each week. It's going to be on business, marketing, or a topic that we covered in the episode at all. We'd love your support, and it would help us in developing the intellect around this series. But without going on too much longer, let's get back into this episode. What I was intrigued about for you guys is like, it's now, like you said, an award-winning, independent, full-service ad agency. You've got 230 staff. You've got these offices, I think, San Fran, New York, Chicago, Seattle. All yeah. these wonderful clients, all these wonderful awards. You know, in hindsight, uh, it's easy to say soul on science today, but what, when did you realize that was your thing and when did you realize it was significant enough in the market? 
Well, we recently rolled that, rolled that sort of new positioning out yeah. and we realized we wanted to stand for creativity and performance. So that's really what sold science. That's our approach, but it's, you know, we really added performance. So like insight, research, measurement of the work, optimization. We added that group maybe a year ago right. and creative is always what we've done strategy and creative. And we paired that together to say we're a, you know, an agency that does creativity and performance to build great brands and just keep the elevator pitch to that. And, and the way we do it is through soul and science. And I think prior to that, we would explain ourselves more as we we can do strategy and creative and media buying and planning and production. And we have a social media arm. And so we were doing it more on services, mm -hmm. but not on what we offer. And I think, you know, it took us a while to develop that, but we realized we got to simplify what we offer. And then the way we do it in all the departments and all the services, it's kind of secondary. Yeah. And so that was, that was a big switch for us to not think about, Oh, we can do all these things, but to think about, we put creative and performance together. And, you yeah. know, then when, when we get hired, we can go into, yeah, we can do media buying and planning. We have social experts. We have, we can do TV, you know, we can do blah, blah, blah. So it's more about what they get. You know, we put these two things together to build great brands. And, uh, you know, it took, it took a while to kind of develop that. And, and the hard si simplifying your pitch is the hardest thing. <laughs> and it's easy to do, which is yeah. crazy. It's like less is more, right? Simplifying your message. And we do it for clients day in and day out. You know, we get right to the heart of what they're trying to communicate and do it in the simplest, most consistent way we can doing it to yourself for whatever reason. I guess that's why brands hire agencies because doing it for yourself so, uh, is so much different and it's yeah. so much harder, you know? So it took us longer to get there because we did on our own. Yeah. It's so funny. You mentioned that because we, we've had that recently with an advisor who, um, I guess our management team will sit down for two hours with um, once a quarter and just discuss these sort of things. And he literally said to me, like, what is the job to be done for you? Like, yeah. who is your, because at the end of the day, the end customer is the CMO, right? And what do they come to you for these different things? They know generally there's a pocket of performance that of, you know, let's say 50% of their budget goes to, and then a certain percentage to creative. And then what's this other thing that you can fulfill, which for us is, is something that is just not so much cool, but different, so to speak, particularly with the yeah, talent you're specialized. Side. Yeah. You're yeah. specialized. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I'm guilty of that as well as like, I think everyone is, is you just talk about the services you offer, but people don't match the services. They just want the outcome. Like what is the job that you're giving me? You know? Yeah, I think the thing that you guys can say you do, and I could be wrong, uh, but I think the thing you do is really build, uh, you build community. Yeah. You know, you build community for, for brands, which is different than planning what their positioning is going to be for the next three years. Yeah. You know, or selling. I mean, obviously you can drive sales for products and services, but it's much more that the value I would say is building that community, that base that they can continually, you know, talk, talk to. Yeah. Um, and the, the margin which is in, worth a lot of value. Yeah. The margin in the game of performance and sales is a lot tighter as well. So it's almost like, do you want to compete in that space? Yes. You should do it for clients who, who you currently have, but should you compete directly with the big players that, uh, the entire focus is performance. Yeah. So that that was so. that was the that was the big insight for me. You know, if you think about your experience so far as a founder, I'm always curious on next steps and where to go. For us as an agency, we've got past that five A's where you're doing anything for anyone, anytime, anywhere, any price. That usual shtick, and then you find your specialization, and then usually it's a bunch of services, and now it's a bunch of outcomes and you get cl closer and closer to that thing. And we yeah. need to make our head count is small. It's five or six people. We need to make the jump to 25. And these sound like minuscule numbers 
in between the amount of people that you have, but I know speaking to other independent agency founders that it can happen a lot quicker when you go from like 25 to a hundred is a lot quicker than five to 25. Um, yeah, there's, there's definitely different, there's different levels in where you plateau. Yeah. It's like certain growth is easier than other size growth. What, what mistakes do you think agency principals continually make when they're trying to go from that 10 staff range to 50 to a hundred to 200? Is it not recognizing soon enough that that plateau has happened? Um, no, cause a lot of times you, you could plan all you want, but the universe is going to give you what it gives you sometimes, you know? <laughs> so it's not, it's not so cut and dry. I think the mistake, and these are, these are going to be things that you will have heard, but it's true. The leadership, the key leadership is kind of everything. And everything stems from that. And if you have someone, an amazing talent, amazing person, you have to keep that person at all costs and you have to hire forward. You have to, you don't have to bring that person on and stretch a little bit to get that person because those there's key game changers that just blow your agency up. And while everyone is important at an agency, there is that 80, 20 rule that like 20%, are the game changers and trying to identify, you know, your job as an owner is trying to identify as you start to grow who those game changers are that really will make all the difference. Um, do you think, do you think those are department leads or do you think there are, they are just specific positions, i.e. creative directors as an example? I think that, yeah, I think they're, I think they're usually, you know, the leader of a, a, a division or a department that will just, grow it up but it could be an incredibly talented creative person that you must have or it could be you know as you start to hire like a new business person that's incredibly important mm. another thing that i've that i always believe in is investing in maybe when you get to the next size maybe if you're like 15 or 20 investing in an outside pr firm Okay. That will get press for you and your clients and the work that you do, like okay. in the trades, yeah, beyond the trades, because that pull sales mechanism of getting your name out there so that clients call you is going to save you a lot of time and money. Yeah, that's that's definitely the next stage of our marketing for us is less inbound contact, more emphasis on content that can result in outbound relationships and yeah. particularly that PR component. I've always wondered that because we've got big trade media here, ad week umbrella. So you think it's, it's more about the PR firms working with you to get that positioning in the trade media around like a, a recent account you've won or something like that. Yeah. Or, or, you know, you write a piece on the, the power of TikTok. Yeah. For brands or building community for brands. And instead of it going uh, just on your LinkedIn, they'll get it placed somewhere Yeah, that, you know, a client might read and we'll, we'll give you a call or they'll come up with strategies that you're not, you don't have time to think about mm. of how to get your name out there, but investing in yourself and your business to get the word out there will really get the phone to ring. Yeah. You, you yeah. mentioned before about leads of departments and things like that. I, I mean, obviously you have partners in the firm. It seems that most are, are typically specialists or, or focus on a certain area as opposed to, um, you know, there's obviously partners who are things like operating officers as well. But um, in particular, I'm thinking about someone like Brendan, who is clearly the social influencer star, uh, star at, uh, at Mechanism. So, you know, in my mind, he's probably one of the smartest people in this space at the moment. Definitely. Yeah, definitely um, a thought leader. What have you learned from Brendan and other specialists like him in bringing them into the fold? Yeah, well, back to my point of the keeping stars on your team. I had, I had started working with Brendan 
he interned me interned for me when I was that's right uh, yeah. at, a, at a different age, which is how we started. Yeah. Uh, and then he he sort of worked with me for a large chunk of his career, and then he started his own social media agency mm-hmm. called Epic Signal. That's right, and I had missed having that expertise in house that I ended up convincing my partners for us to buy his firm and fold them into mechanism. And so that's a very expensive lesson of like, you've got, you got to keep those stars Yeah. because you know, when he left, I was like, yeah, okay. You know, maybe it's time. And then I realized lacking that, that specificity and that, that knowledge and that thought leadership was, was a, was a, a ding for the agency. So I had to, I had to figure out a way to bring him back in. And, uh, it, co- it cost me more money than making sure he stayed and keeping him happy. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> so was that your only act? Is that the only acquisition that you guys have made? Yeah, that's the only one. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So that, that is a good point. Cause I was reading this book, the business of expertise and they're like, Oh no, you should let people just fly the coop go and do their own thing. Maybe they'll come back to you and sort of, this is a lesson of no, actually you should hold on. To well, I think, person. I think, you know, 90% of those people, you can let them do that, but you got to identify that. Yeah. Not Brennan. Those, those key people that, that you have to have. Yeah. And make, make sure you, you know, give them a piece of the company, whatever you have to do to lock them in, lock them in. Cause it's going to cost you a lot more. <laughs> In, in sweat and worry and stress and searching, then it's worth, you know. Before we get into rapid fire questions, I want to ask you about selling a leader. I know, I know the firm was involved in um, the Biden Harris logo, but uh, I, I don't think, I, I don't, I don't know if you were involved in that, but obviously you've had experience, yeah, experience definitely. with sort of center left organizations, campaign groups, um, it's fascinating to me because I know one day that area, that area of politics and, you know, reading a lot of things like propaganda has always fascinated me. Like how do you sell a person in particularly in the field of politics? So, yeah, you know, you've obviously had this cross pollination from the ad game and the political game. How would you sell a leader if you were tasked with the next Democrat campaign? Let's say Biden gets his next eight years and then you've got to pitch some, I don't know, Kamala or someone yeah, for yeah. the next term. How would you go about it? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a political marketer. Yeah. You think we it's a do, different field? We did do the logo for the Biden Harris successful campaign, but we, um, you know, we, we I, you know, I, I think, uh, it's all about, you know, consistency of message and having a point of view. And like all good brands, having a catchy handle <laughs> is a game changer. Yeah. You know, make America great again. It's pretty, pretty freaking memorable. Very memorable. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he, it was ripped off. Uh, Reagan used it. Yeah. You know, it, it, and it was used before him. So it was repurposed, but I think the power of a of a tagline and a slogan can't be undervalued. And Democrats typically don't like doing that. They don't like having like one line or one thing they stand with. So that's one thing I would definitely do. Yeah. Um, consistency of message is important, and it's overlooked in in that sphere, but it's important, you know. It's really interesting. I, I've started watching this doco. Um... Someone did a similar thing on YouTube. The channel was CCP Gray, but the doco is called How to Become a Tyrant. And uh, it's just like the playbook of becoming a tyrant. And and there's all these little cues that you see and around that politicians utilize, not to say that politicians are tyrants, but it's just really interesting to see how many things, things like slogans are so useful. And they talk yeah. to in this doco, what is the specific cognitive bias that is utilized in that case? So, you know, going to that science arm of your business, how, how does a cognitive bias fulfill something like a slogan and slogans are brilliant. 
because a a good slogan can condense an entire movement or idea Definitely. into like a couple of words. Absolutely. So yeah, it was it was very enlightening watching that in particular. I mean, to me, there's 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 three rules of marketing in general, and I would apply that to you know personal brand, politicians, political marketing, brands at large, mm. and it's you know a simple message taking something complex and making it simple. Yeah, it is c- consistency of message, but variety of where you show up. But, but you show up in the space correctly, but with a consistent message from the brand. And yeah. the third is where I was going on your business, but it's, it's really involvement marketing and how do you get the audience or the voter or your followers? How do you get that to be part of your marketing team? Mm. You know, how do you get that to extend your message the community. farther than, yeah, the, yeah, community. And that, that to me is the trick of, of successful marketing campaigns. Yeah, that, that, that is a tricky thing. How do you make it organic, like truly organic and not just like contrived? Um, that's, that's literally the, get the name of the game in this era, right? Definitely. All right, let's do some rapid fire questions to finish things off. Okay, cool. I'm sending you a copy of my book, by the way. Amazing. I would really appreciate that. Um, I'll send one for your wife slash business partner. Awesome. You can read it in bed together. <laughs> do, you, she, do you know what's so funny? It's like, because I read in bed every night. I read a lot of books. Um, yeah. Because it's the only way that I can sort of calm down at night. I can't be on my phone or anything. Yeah. So I'll good. be sitting there reading. Um, what have I read recently? It's called The uh, the Town and the Square or something like that. And it's about networks. And it, it came out sort of in the midst of that Cambridge Analytica thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it, it talks a lot about networks and the impacts of, of those in society. And um, so I'll be sitting there reading this 500 page tome of like networks and, and shit like that. And she's sitting there just like looking at dogs and cats. And oh my God. <laughs> it, it, it sort of shows that, uh, you know, for us, very different personalities and how they work well together, both as a couple and as business owners. Cause there's things that she can do that I could never do and vice versa. And uh-huh. um, yeah, it's so funny because I'll, I'll be ready. I guarantee if she had the book, like she'd probably get 10 pages in and she'd be like, can you just tell me what it's about? Oh <laughs> can I listen God, to like, If it's the audio book, she could listen to the audio book for sure. All right. So rapid fire questions. Um, best purchase under $200. So I, uh, you know what a Theragun is? Yeah. Oh, uh-huh, okay. Yeah, I have a Theragun. I work out a lot and I'm sore all the time and okay. I'm getting older. This thing is like a game changer. It does yeah. that. There's a Hypervolt. There's all those sort of massage guns, Uh huh. but they actually do work. They're fantastic. Okay, so talk to me about that because um, it's called percussive ther- therapy, I think. Like, why is this thing so good? Because I've heard a lot of people talking about this recently in the last year let's say and i'm tempted to buy one why should i buy one do they have like are do you see them popping up over there everywhere i mean it's on it's all over social media right you can just buy it online basically it um when your muscles are sore from working out they get inflamed or your muscles break down that's how they build back up right yeah and so a massage gun helps the healing process speed up because it basically directs blood flow, just like um, acupuncture or massage, uh-huh. like sports massage. It directs yeah. blood flow to the area of soreness yeah, and reduces inflammation and lets the muscle basically get back to normal quicker. Okay. So for pain management, but also for a speedier recovery, they're incredibly useful. Mm. And it just feels good. Like hitting yourself with a gun or <laughs> whatever sore. Does it feel like you've had a massage? Like it's just a similar tension relief, right? Yeah, it's similar, except you, you use it like uh, maybe like two minutes in a certain area. It's very quick. Okay. Wow. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been sussing this one out for a while now. 
Sarah Gunn. Good. I like that. That's a good answer. Um, podcast, doco, or movie you've been watching lately? So I watched uh, the Bee Gees documentary mm-hmm. on HBO. Did you have you seen it? No, um, they're an Australian band as well. I know that's why uh, it's relevant here. Yeah, but they were from Australia. Uh, they ended up basically moving to Miami. They uh-huh. recorded a, a couple albums in Miami and then ended up staying there basically. But they started in Australia, and that's where they first gained popularity. And I think it was Melbourne. Uh, yeah, I think it was. It was somewhere like regional um, that they originally started out. They would have gone to my um, my father in law. He's seventy, and uh, he, there's a photo he's got in in front of um, the big cathedral in Rome, uh, the Basilica, and he looks like with his two friends like a Bee Gees cover, and he's always been obsessed with the Bee Gees. Um, they're so good. Yeah, they're so good. Um, so I, I kind of slept on them for a long time. Yeah, right. And my girlfriend and I watched uh, watched this documentary, and then we started listening to music all the time okay. again. And uh, they're so good. Actually, they were born on the Isle of Man. That's right. And then they lived in Manchester, and then they moved to Australia, Queensland. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, and then Crib Island. I don't know where that is. <laughs> so you're a big Bee Gees fan. Um, yeah. And the documentary basically showed how influential they were and the rise and fall of them because they became known as like a disco band. Uh huh. And then there's this whole movement in the U S around disco sucks and like yeah. the end of disco cause it became too commercialized. Yeah. And then they sort of had a second career, which was, songwriting for other bands because no one wanted to hear from them again again after <laughs> di- that whole disco sucks era and then they had another resurgence and then uh, and there's only one one of the brothers lived yeah there's three the- bgs and then there's andy gibb he yeah. died of a drug overdose the other two died of i think one had cancer i can't remember and then the the main main guy barry gibbs the only one that's still alive yeah and he's still got his um aussie accent too uh, they did a whole yeah, 60 minutes thing on them recently. They've had a resurgence as well on uh, TikTok. Like, um, uh, like a few BG songs are like trending quite a lot. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, well, you're the TikTok expert, so that's yeah. So that's good insight. it's it's so funny. Like I heard it the other someone had mixed it, and I just went straight back to um because we're in lockdown. I think I told you earlier, and on you that did. um. What's that main BG song? BG's everyone knows the song. Um, Staying Alive. Yeah. And it looks like they're walking down a boardwalk. And I just forward it to our group chat with my father in law. I'm like, hey, I found Charles walking down the boardwalk. No. Way. Um, but yeah, that that staying alive is trending massively at the moment. All right, last question for you. Quotes you live your life by or think about often. Well, there's one that I really like which is um do you know the you know tottenham hotspurs yep so they have this motto this club motto to dare is to do okay which i love and to me it's like i always love things that are simple to dare is to do is simple right it's five words but to me it's really the idea of always being courageous enough to to do something like the act of attempting or, or m- making the move or doing something that's, that's the act of, of in and of itself. Mm. And so if you're doing that, if you're taking that dead, if you're or there, if you're being brave, if you're being courageous, that means you're doing something. And so I always kind of think about that and, and not being paralyzed, not, and not having inaction, but always yeah. trying to make sure I'm, I'm courageous enough to try something. And are you a Tottenham fan? Not really, no. Okay. <laughs> who, who's your Who's your APL team then? I like uh, Manchester City. Okay, I'm a Man United fan. Like, oh I, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I I play. I grew up in the era of David Beckham, so um, being a soccer fan, that was that was the team, right? Um, yeah, he's like he's amazing. He's the king. Uh, 
Jason Harris, thank you so much for coming on. I know it's late over there. Where can people find you on the interwebs? Um, the soulfulart.com is my website where you can learn more about the book. And then uh, you can find me at Jason underscore Harris on the socials. On, on and, all socials? Uh, on all socials. And then mechanism.com, M-E-K-A-N-I-S-M.com is our agency's website. I'll, um, I'll make sure we link all that. Um, thanks, man. But otherwise, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It was a blast. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. If you do like it, please subscribe. And of course, like if you're watching the YouTube video as well. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. You can also find our Clips channel in the description. For audio, if you're not already listening, you can search Uncommon on Pocket Cast, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts quite easily. For video, if you're not watching, you can search Uncommon on YouTube. And for behind the scenes takes and clips uh, on social media, then definitely check out at Uncommon underscore show on Instagram. But otherwise, look, thanks so much for tuning in. And until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>